The cross-border payments market is poised for significant growth, projected to surge from around 190 trillion US dollars in 2023 to 290 trillion in 2030, fueled by an uptick in global trade and international investments. This expansion presents a substantial opportunity for banks and other market participants to capitalize on. To look at this in more detail, we're joined by Sanjeev Chatrath, Partner Financial Services at EY's Asia-Pacific Payments Leader. Welcome, Sanjeev, to Cybos TV. Hope you're enjoying yourself here in Beijing. I'm sure you've had a very busy couple of days to start off, but let's get straight into it. In the context of today's global economy, can you shed a little bit of light for us on the current scale of the payments market and drivers for the surge in growth? Sure, very happy to. Uh, firstly, thank you very much, Johnny, for having me. Lovely to see you again, Sanjeev. So I think, uh, I mean, fundamental to any well-functioning financial services, I believe it is about safe and efficient movement of money. That's what's represented by payments. So hence, we are seeing tremendous amount of focus with our clients in terms of how they can improve in line with the G20 roadmap. Uh, a lot of the things, whether it's around improving cost, reducing time that ta and that's taken to transfer money, whether it's around enhancing transparency or indeed even financial inclusion. Uh, there are a few factors over the last few years that have really accelerated the growth of payments. I'll say the trifactor that comes to mind is firstly amazing boom around e-commerce. I think that's completely revolutionized the, the world of payments. There's also been a lot of regulatory reforms that are increasingly giving a lot of encouragement in terms of what can be done. And and I'd say last but not least is all the technological advancements. I think we kind of see our digital footprint everywhere we go and more and more technologies are indeed accelerating this. So I'll say all of those factors are contributing to this. Uh, Cross-border payments in particular is, is ripe for disruption and transformation. It also is right now representing perhaps one of the most meaningful revenue pools for the industry, uh, both because of foreign exchange opportunities that are there, but also the inefficiencies that that's, uh, stay in that. And in a world with increasingly looking like lower interest rates, mm -hmm. fee-based incomes become more valuable. And hence, that perhaps also explains why the focus on it. I want to dive deep into that, Sanjeev, a little bit more. The top transformative trends that you're seeing in payments, what do you think are the, the greatest opportunities that you see for banks? So I think there are quite a few, Angie. In fact, this week, we've just published a white paper which talks about some of those. Uh, a few that really jump to mind would be, first and foremost, real-time payments. I think cross-border payments historically has taken way too long uh, for a lot of the beneficiaries to receive the funds. It's created a lot of friction. We are seeing a lot of collaboration happening in the industries to actually be able to transmit value in a much more efficient way. The second thing I'll say is uh, adoption of standards. And I think uh, obviously led by SWIFT with ISO 2022, I think that's also created a lot of opportunities for people to be able to capture enriched data that accompanies these payments. Uh, I'd say a third big area of focus that I see with our financial institution uh, clients is around how do you protect uh, against any kind of financial crime? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, there are bad actors mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the ecosystem, so you've got to be very, very resilient to be able to safeguard against any, any of those. A few other themes that really jump up is a lot of new technology when it comes to things like digital assets, digital currencies, by nature of them having a lot of ingredients that can be very, very valuable in a decentralized open environment is also getting a lot of uh, traction. And and then perhaps the, the fact that there's more collaboration across countries is accelerating also those transformations. We are seeing, just as you heard with some of the other uh, speakers previously, a lot more collaboration with fintechs, other banks, regulators across countries. And last but not least, I'll say is around embedded finance. Uh, a lot of the firms are recognizing that folks do not do not wake up every day saying that I want to do banking. They want to get on with their lives. They want to do things as they wish. So the power of technology nowadays is such that it can actually embed mm -hmm. a lot of those day-to-day -day things that are perhaps required for transfer of value and for you to procure things in, in your life uh, and make it a little bit more transparent or invisible. Well, it's been about people wanting to get on with their lives. The ease of use is is so important. And of course, that brings new challenges, making payments faster, uh, cheaper, more transparent. Uh, can you comment on some of the, the risks over these uh, challenges that have emerged in the efforts to to make things faster, cheaper, etc.? And, uh, and how are they being mitigated? Yeah, so I'll say, Johnny, two things that really stand out. I mean, of course, whenever you're using a lot more technology, there's also a risk of more compromise of that technology. So cyber threats are on a rise, and I think it's across the board. So the volume and the velocity, as well as the veracity of those 
threats is on the rise. Uh, but at the same time, I think technology is also a great safeguard. So, I mean, we op op nowadays talk a lot about AI, I mean, not just for how you need to safeguard for a AI, but I think nowadays AI also has the potential for you to protect against a lot of the threats that are there. So as a cyber would be one. The second one would be around financial crime. Uh, I think there is a, a huge degree of focus across the industry to try and protect and safeguard around anti-money laundering initiatives that are being driven, but also uh, across fraud, phishing, and, and things like that. So I'd say those would be the two really that stand out. And for the second one, I'll say there is great momentum across the regulators to be able to collaborate uh, so that you've got much better sharing of information across some of the bad actors. In terms of last mile delivery and all the risks that you've outlined that you really need to keep an eye on, you know, we talk about embedded finance, we talk about ease of use. Part of that is going to be cross-border payments, right? Can you outline any pilot projects or any kind of initiatives that you've seen that really can share an example of cross-border payments? Sure. Uh, a number of them, Angie. So Bank of International Settlements has actually been promoting a few of those. Uh, and then some of the regulators also have. So just to name a few would be, one would be around digital currencies. So Embridge has a lot of potential. There's a lot of focus around how you build multi-jurisdictional uh, CBDSA capabilities. Uh, Agora is another one that comes to mind just from the nature of a unified ledgers and how it can potentially help drive much more greater degree of efficiency when it comes to payments. Nexus is another one which comes to mind when I talked about real-time payments. I think there's a lot more collaboration happening uh, across countries to see how you can actually uh, leverage real-time payment infrastructure that exists within the countries to be able to transmit value instantaneously. Uh, so those would be a few, but along with that, I'd say there's also more foundational work that's being done. So ISO 2022, as I mentioned, I think has tremendous, tremendous potential to actually be able to drive greater efficiency and greater value in the industry if it is used natively. Uh, Swift API is another one in terms of real time tracking of payments would, would be another one. Yeah. To focus on collaboration, uh, talk us through some of the most compelling partnerships at the moment that are, that are powering the cross-border payments world. So I'll say... Uh, across uh, the board and, and there's multiple cases of them so there's one which is in Asia I mean closer to home a lot more collaboration happening across different regulators uh, Project Nexus being one example of that the other one that comes to mind is SEPA Instant um, I think to be able to drive greater transmission of value in a much more efficient way uh, I think these are just a few examples of collaboration in the olden days, there were a lot more initiatives being driven on a domestic-only basis. Uh, what is encouraging, again, under the, the overview of G20 is much greater degree of transparency, collaboration across regulators, and it requires both private as well as public sector firms to come together to be able to actually drive uh, the outcomes that, that are being sought over here. I want to pick up on ISO 20022. Um, what are the most powerful use cases for adoption that you're seeing? So... Quite a few. In fact, we've started seeing a lot of traction, particularly with the progressive firms. Uh, just last month, I think now, close to about 26% of payments globally actually go through ISO 2022 formats. The potential of that actually, if it is used on a native basis, is tremendous. And a few use cases that come to mind would be customer due diligence. So anything around financial crime prevention, we're seeing a lot of opportunities around those areas. Uh, we're seeing a lot of focus around how do you reduce false positives on a, any particular day, depending on which bank you talk to, close to 5 to 10% of the payment transactions actually generate alerts. 99% mm -hmm. of those alerts are false positive. Mm -hmm. So if you had greater data in those transactions, you can significantly reduce the number of those false positives that are there. Yeah. Another case of uh, uh, ISO 20 or 22 at scale, I have observed is around exception handling, investigations. Anywhere between 2 to 5% of transactions typically require investigations, which require anywhere between 3 to 5 minutes for operators to be able to investigate and then remediate in those transactions. If you had better quality data, that again can address that. So a lot of the infrastructures there, uh, that's just on the bank side. I'm also observing on the corporate side for as banks clients, there's a lot of value to be able to adopt natively the ISO 2022 better cash uh, management, treasury forecasting, as well as better insights around your customer flows. Yeah. Because now you have all that accompanying data along with the payments that you can mine and you can generate better better insights from. 
finally, uh, Sanjeev, uh, Sabas Ramon is looking ahead, of course. Uh, so talk us through where you see the biggest opportunity for transformation in the cross-border payments industry over the next five to seven years, shall we say? I'd say uh, joint digitalization is is here to stay. I mean, I'm very encouraged with the level of excitement that I see at Cybos around digitalization. There's tremendous amount of momentum, and particularly with the multi-jurisdictional CBDCs, that's got a lot of potential. It can solve for many things, uh, given the nature of CBDCs and digital currencies, including the fact that you've got tokenization and programmability built into it. So I, I do believe, I think, the future of transfer of value there's going to be components of those in terms of programmability uh, built into that, along with tokenization. Um, and, and yeah, the, I, I'm very encouraged with the, the momentum as well as the direction of travel. Well, an encouraging future, but we're certainly enjoying the present uh, of, of your company here on Sabos TV, Sanjeev. Thank you so much for your time here on day two of Beijing 2024. Sanjeev Chatra, third partner, financial service at EY Asia's Pacific Payments leader. Thanks again and have a fantastic Beijing 24.